Hoizo, how we doing? Hope everyone's well. Today's episode will be on the annoying orange. No, without further ado, let's get into it, eh? Theme Boy Dikaima had the first episode of Annoying Orange in October 2009. The first episode was an instant hit, and despite the fact that it was supposed to be just one episode, there was a hunger for more, unintended, and the audience received what they were looking for. The Annoying Orange is kind of the definition of zooming, somewhat before it was popularised, and the success of these four episodes airing for, between October 2009 and January 2010 resulted in massive success. Upon the further success of these videos, which have been reviewed 351.79 times as of present, that being the first four episodes, and around 109 million times by June 2010, wanted Boydekheimer to make the Annoying Orange its own show. The show consisted of an orange as seen on the screen. This orange would be joined by a cast of other fruits and edible foods and, well, random objects like knives. And, yeah, it would essentially just come out with random buzzwords and weird situations. It does sound corny, unfunny, and a little annoying. I'm sure it was. But it was low quality brain power and relatively, you know, entertaining stuff. This is the exact thing that seven year old me would eat up and hundreds of millions like me also did. The channel's got over a billion views by this point, so you know, let's not, you know, talk too much shit, eh? Now, don't get me wrong, content isn't meant to be highbrow, it's made for kids and young adults, but it certainly is an entertainment to a value. Well, certainly, there was at the time. So it used this technology that hadn't really been seen massively beforehand, of course it had been used, but what it basically was is Boy the Kaima would film an orange, an apple, a knife even, and basically superimpose his voice acting and his face, or his co-actors or co-workers, faces and mouths, onto an animal object. Now this was ridiculous, and the technology isn't, you know, super high tech, but the fact that it hadn't really been seen before was intriguing to most people. Now don't get me wrong, the technology wasn't ridiculously high budget and it's something you always see almost every day now on these modern kind of uh, editing software, I mean, I know mine has it. But, you know, it was strange enough to draw an attention, draw an audience. An annoying orange hit 1 million subs by August 2010, becoming one of the first channels to ever do this on the platform. Now people started to sit up and take note as a result of this. And one of those people was Rob Scorcher. Chief Content Officer, Cartoon Network. The deal with Cartoon Network was signed in 2012, and The Collective signed the license with Annoying Orange Incorporated also in the same year. Now, this is where things get a bit interesting. See, the acquisition of the cost for Cartoon Network isn't really known, but although it's estimated to be within the high six, low seven digits. Now, obviously for a company that's only three years old at the time, that was humongous, you know? They'd basically gone from filming in their the kitchen or wherever else to then filming in proper studios with proper editing software. Basically going from mom's basement to, you know, Hollywood, essentially. Which is incredible. Upon this, they were hit with a lawsuit. Oidekaima was hit by a lawsuit from H2M, a North Dakota advertising agency, that alleged that Oidekaima had stolen intellectual property. One of the clients had created what was known as the Talking Orange. Now, Plantiff's H2M was deployed onto television at a similar time to Boyd and Spencer's first release of The Annoying Orange in 2009. When finding out about this, Cartoon Network picked up Annoying Orange. They hit Boyd and Cartoon Network with this lawsuit. Now, of course, there are certain similarities, otherwise there wouldn't be a case in the first place. But basically, it revolved around the fact that there was an orange in this advertisement, with a mouth and teeth. Now, yes, there is certainly similarity. But the lawsuit goes further than that. The lawsuit even claimed that the voice was too similar, in an annoying fashion, which further prompted the persecution to press charges. The main reason they had, however, was the fact that they came from the similar area of Fargo, a city in North Dakota, where both Boydikheimer and Spencer, and also the clients of H2M, were from. And this does seem a little peculiar. Now, H2M had released their advertisement before the Annoying Orange had come out. And they claimed that Boyd Kai would probably seen this on telly, or in a shop window, or anything, and copied it for his own content. 
Now this isn't implausible. However, Boy the Climber claims to this day they never saw it. But again, there is definitely a case to be made here. Now, no one really knows the outcome of this case. Basically, H2M tried to press charges claiming damages from Annoying Orange Incorporated and also an injunction stopping Grove or Boy the Climber from profiting off Annoying Orange. It's not implausible to suggest that H2M might have taken at least something from this court case, due to the production value of Noy Orange subsequently diminishing. Not massively, but noticeably. So, you know, it leads me to believe that there might have been an out-of-court setting, bearing in mind Boyd Kainu certainly hasn't lost money, he's still earning money from Noy Orange. So that's why it leads me to believe there might be an out-of-court settlement. Again, but quote me on that. It's just a theory. A game theory. No. Why would there be an out-of-court settlement? Well, many reasons, really. Due to the fact that the lawsuit coincided with Cartoon Network striking a deal with Annoying Orange Incorporated, it does make me think that they were being opportunistic and just kind of wanting to make a quick buck. However, the quality drop that I mentioned before is also an indicator that Annoying Orange Incorporated did suffer. Now, of course, a company like h 2 probably would be able to touch Cartoon Network due to the fact that they're, you know, connected in the industry and they'd have fantastic lawyers. So this makes me believe that it came directly out of Boy Dikaim's pockets. Now, why do I think that it wasn't a success for H2M? Well, that's because Boy Dikaim is still clearly earning money from Annoying Orange and the other projects he's worked with through um, AO Incorporated. See, you have mentioned Junction. The store boy Kaimer and his team from earning money was clearly unsuccessful, and I have a reason for saying this. And that is the purchase of Boy Kaimer's most recent house. I say most recent, sorry, the house he's currently living in. He, he resides in Sierra Madre, uh, California, in which the average house cost 1.3 million. Now, if the man made no money from Annoying Orange since 2013, then I very much doubt he'd be able to cough up this kind of money. By the way, the quotient for the average house came from Zillow, so it's, you know, fairly reliable. Just want to give a citation there, in case you're questioning it. Now, following this debacle with H2M, Boyd Kleinman found himself once again in legal trouble. This time with Collective Digital Studios, one of the people I mentioned earlier that he signed with. However, he was the one prosecuting this time. He alleged that in 2014, that his management team had been refusing to pay him due to his labour. Intended. As a result, he decided to take him to the cleaners, beginning his second court case in two years. Boy the Kaimer alleged the Collective Digital Studio had refused to pay him. At the time, 2014, he was one of the most subscribed YouTube channels on the website, and still to this day is one of the most viewed channels on YouTube. The lawsuit states, For months, the Collective has refused to play Boy the Kaimer and his production company, Annoying Orange Incorporated. Any revenue generated from the exploiting of Annoying Orange and other content has been kept all of the revenues for itself. Now, further recording the lawsuits, the collective may be going out of business and does not have the financial ability to pay Boy the Kaimer the money he is owed. See, Boy the Kaimer claimed that he filed for arbitration in late November 2014, but the collective digital studio just completely ignored him, refusing to arbitrate his dispute. So again, this doesn't look good. He's basically claimed that in 2014, November, the collective stopped funding his projects, something that they were very much expected to do. He then alleges that he waited a few months before pressing charges, saying, I haven't been paid. I can't stay afloat. You know, if you think I've got, you know, all this stuff to pay for, as you would, and you're not getting paid, it would start to rob you the wrong way which is why he eventually took it to court, saying that's the only option to get paid. He resultantly took the case to the Los Angeles Superior Court judge to immediate order the firm to kind of pay him his arbitration. Again, the result wasn't made public. However, the high fructose adventures of Annoying Orange was cancelled in March 2014 with a no renewal as a result, which would have been renewed around this time, which would suggest that the collective no longer saw Annoying Orange Incorporated as valuable assets or they could no longer afford to hold on to them. It was kind of one of the two. This once again led to a decline in budget, resulting in a decline in quality, which hit the channel. This led to a decline in viewership. However, the channel, you know, was still within the top 100 respectively in 2015 and 2016. From here, not a lot happens to the channel. Certain collaborators with the channel, such as Toby Turner, aka Tabasco, said, you know, stop being collaborated with, if you will. The channel's decline wasn't particularly unexpected, to be honest. 
The idea was absolutely absurd, but, you know, incredibly creative, it's got to be said. However, once you've seen one of them, you've practically seen all of them. That's not to say they're not very entertaining, you know. Watching Grandpa Lemon playing Slenderman is peak viewing. However, the idea isn't so able to be reinvented. You can't recast it as many times as you'd think. Channels like PewDiePie, Dan TDM, and Shoe on Head have all managed to reinvent themselves and keep up with, you know, changing in the system. However, Annoying Orange just hasn't adapted and has been left behind almost. It's not exactly like the content isn't quality. They put in a lot of effort and to be coming out with new app ideas almost 15 years on from when they started uploading every week. It's highly commendable. Final topic of this video comes to 2021. Now, I know I've skipped a bit, you know, 2016 to 2021, but not a lot happens, not really any controversy. They just keep cruising, keep uploading, you know, on we go. In 2021, Annoying Orange announces an NFT line. First NFT was a video of their first ever upload. Of course, this was enhanced to 4K and fit all the kind of newest and highest tech upgrades you could possibly have. This video was probably leaked and the NFT's value dropped massively and they ended up not putting it up. It's honestly very embarrassing. They ended up releasing the video for free, which is a bit of a shame, because Boy the Gamer was actually going to profit off this video to kind of keep the production high for the future. So, all of you that were complaining about the Annoying Orange being an NFT, I get you. But it was for the greater good, alright? Anyway, Boy the Gamer lost out. I just feel bad for him. So that takes us to today. The Annoying Orange still uploads, they still get a lot of views, and they'll still be a cultural phenomenon. You know, they'll be remembered as kind of one of those old school YouTube channels, a bit like epic rap arts of history. People look back on and, you know, they're still relevant, but nowhere near as culturally significant as they once were. But yeah, that's about it. Hopefully I'll see you in the next one. If you liked, then do like a cheer. I'm done here. See you. Good stuff.